Thank you, Mr. Irvin. You did an awesome job of directing us. Thank you. <laughs> I want to welcome everybody today. It's nice to see everybody's smiling faces and look outside and see this beautiful day that God's provided for us. Well, I'm pretty sure, pretty certain that every, every person in this room has fallen at one time or another for various reasons. And my wife reminded me, don't, don't think you stand lest you fall. So that could be part of this as well. But I can remember as a child, probably around four or five years old, maybe no more than six, running to get home. It was late and getting close to being dark. Plus, I should have already been home and just knew I was going to get in trouble for being late. We were staying in a cabin in a migrant camp while picking strawberries to earn a living. All well, the way home was sort of hilly and ruddy. While well, being young and still totally, not totally familiar with the effects of inertia, I ran as fast as my short legs and body would take me until I encountered a sizable rock. With my foot, I stumbled and into a larger small boulder which to me was like hitting a Mack truck going at 100 miles an hour. Well, I tripped and I got skinned up, skinned my shins, my knees. And I'm almost sure that I got up, assessed the situation, and then proceeded to kick the Mack truck out of desperation. You can imagine I just added to what was already hurting, you know. Well, I was bruised and humilified, humilified, humiliated, yet not beaten. Excuse me. I got up and continued on home, trying to maintain my composure as much as a four or five year old could. Fortunately, I didn't get into the trouble that I thought I would, or I supposed I would. If there's a lesson to be learned from my personal story, it is to watch where you are going and plan ahead for the unseen. Of course, this is not always as easy to do when we are younger, but as we get older, we should become more aware of our surroundings. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 9, you don't want to tell, I have it in my notes, but beginning in verse 24, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. Now I was beating the air there. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. Lest, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Remember that Satan would like nothing more than to steal our crown to eternal life in God's kingdom and is always throwing obstacles in our pathways. It's not a, as if someone's going to come up to you and just snatch your crown right off your head. It's much more complicated than that. He, Satan, uses distractions to attempt to draw us away from God and his kingdom. We have external op obstacles. Some of these distractions are everyday events in our lives that we allow to take control of our inner thoughts, such as work, lack of work, causing financial stress, health issues, marital and relationship problems. And added to this, we have the stress of constant bombardment of TV, movies, radio, plus all the modern technologies of computers, smartphones, which I believe have every possible app available except for one for God. Now these are these technical beasts, that's what I call them, are not as all bad in themselves. It's how we use them and relate to them. The problem enters when we become obsessed with them. Believe me, we can all get caught up with these distractions at one time or another. 
getting caught up watching, sitting for hours and hours watching TV on the computer, surfing the net. We think we're doing something good, but it's just to get distractions to keep us away from doing what we should be doing. <coughs> but when we realize it, we can change our focus and attention back to Christ and His way of thinking. At your, at your leisure, maybe when you get home tonight, read the story about the sower in Mark 4. This is, a, is full of distractions from the start. This is again addressed in Luke 8. Luke 21, 34 says, But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this like, and the day of the return of Christ to come on you unexpectedly. So we caught, caught up so much in daily, daily, daily things that it's going to happen. Well, how did this happen? How did this get here so soon? You know. Poor discomfort is like it smacked you from the side of the head, you know, you weren't even lo looking for it. Then we have the internal, I call internal, ex internal, external obstacles. Then there is the distraction of disputes about the Bible, of what the Bible really says. It comes from unlearned students of the Bible. By this I mean those professing to know doctrine that is merely traditions of men found nowhere in God's Word. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Such as professing a gospel of teaching about Easter and Christmas, the rapture, and going to heaven or hell. Though sincere, sincere, believe it or not, they're caught up in the lies that Satan has spread in order to steal their crowns as well. Of course, these are merely external extractions. And we have external distractions. Now we come to the more, I mean the internal distractions, I'm sorry. We have more internal ob obstacles that confront us as Christians. We are to be aware of our surroundings. Matthew 7, 15 through 20 tell us, if you want to turn there. It's, let's actually start in verse 13. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. The stealing of the crown, my words. There are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. The crown. Again, my words. And there are few who find it. Now, verse 15, this is the one I want you to take notice of. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. But inwardly, they are ravenous wolves. And we are here in this room to testify to this internal struggle that has gone on within the church itself over the last few years. It says, Now you will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Matthew 24, 24 says, For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great wonders and signs to deceive many if possible, uh, if even the elect. Well, today what I want to give you two points. I hope that will help us all keep our crowns that Christ has laid up for us for when we ind indeed endure to the end. Point number one, study. 2 Timothy 2, verses 14 through 18. Remind them, it says, remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord, not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the truth, the word of truth, but shun profane and idle babblings, for they, they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. Hyamus and Philetus are this sort, who, having strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resur resurrection has already passed, 
and they overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows who are his, and that everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. We need to study to prove God's word and distinguish truth from falsehood. Not just believing what someone else tells us, because he may have a title. Follow a man only as he follows Christ. We can learn by the examples of the Bereans in Acts 17. Verse, Acts 17, I'll just go there right quick. This is Paul, Paul and Silas is on their way, went to Berea in verse 10. It says, And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. These, the Bereans, were more fair-minded than those of the, in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness, and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. That's what we need to be doing. Some ways to study are to do a word study of certain subjects, such as faith, using a concordance or other approved study guides. And we have currently have a new uh, Bible, re uh, Bible reading in the year handout available. And if anybody didn't get one or need one, if you'd let me know afterwards, I will, I will print one and bring it next Sabbath. But here are some of the things. Here's the copy of the Bible reading program. We have other study, study guides as well. And on the back table, you'll find booklets that you might want to pull out if you need help in studying. And we have other handbooks. I've pulled a couple off my library. Haley's Handbook. And we have the Harmony of the Gospels. And I'm sure that you probably have more, more in your library than I brought here. And for the speakers, I have one if you want to look at it afterwards. It gives you some topical things here. So... You can also go online and read or request copies of the church's Bible correspondence course, as well as many study papers that are available online. And like I mentioned, check out our own booklet library here in the back. James 1.12 tells us, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For we, when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. I would. It would be a good thing to read all of chapter one and James, uh, all of chapter James chapter one. Well, point number two is pray. We should begin and end our day whenever possible with prayer. David tells us in Matthew or in uh, the Psalms. Let's turn there. Psalms fifty-five. Uh, 16 and 17, in beginning in 16, it says, As for me, I will call upon God, and the Lord shall save me. Evening and morning and noon I will pray. So he prayed three times a day. And cry aloud, and he will hear my voice. We find in Matthew 6, the sample prayer, the example prayer that Christ gave to the apostles or his disciples and how to pray and what to pray about. And James, I'm going to turn to James 5. Going to 13. Again in 13. Is anyone among you is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? 
let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up and if he has committed sins he will be forgiven. It says confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Effective fervent prayer of the righteous man avails much. And you can t continue there on down through 20 um, as you can. If you skip down the number, oh, I'm sorry, verse 19 says, Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Brethren, remember by praying, he will possibly help save someone else's crown. And remember, it is not all about me, or about you, but we are all in this together until the end. And Jesus tells it like it is in Revelation 3. Revelation 3, I'll just read it to you. Verse 11 says, in Jesus' own words, Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. So hold on to it, and hold on tight.